chapter 11. We don't have a Thanksgiving message, but certainly by the time I'm done with this message, you should be giving thanks. Uh, we're, we could move on, and in some sense I should move on past the verses we ended with last week, uh, but there's just something that I, I knew I, I told you last week that I wanted to continue to talk about verse 10, and uh, the more I thought about it, I decided to elaborate, and I want to share with you some things that at Grace Bible Church, I would say there are things that are most surely believed among us. Uh, but there are things that are totally missed by other people. So some of the things, I'm gonna, probably everything I'm going to say today is something that you're familiar with, uh, uh, and you ought to be, uh, but maybe not. And maybe there's someone new that never put all these pieces together, but we're going to do that today. Let me just uh, remind you of the, the closing verses that we studied last week. I'll begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And start in verse 7, but today's study is beyond 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7 says, oh no, I should start with, ver yeah, verse 7. It says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do pray that, uh, that we'll take this book, this Bible that you've given us, realizing that it is divinely inspired and gives us glimpses of things that only by faith we can see. And uh, we pray that our eyes of our understanding would be enlightened as we consider some things that are just said right here in this verse. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, the, we were talking last time, and, and, and just to get the context, because we're going to go from the context here, that Paul's been talking about the head covering of the woman, and we said last time there's three reasons he said that the woman's head should be covered. And that is, the first is for honor's sake, and so it's not dishonor as well, but for honor's sake. Then in verses 7, uh, eight and nine there, it is uh, the order and purpose for the woman's creation. That is, she created, the, she was of the man and she's created for the man. And then the third thing that the woman's head should be covered is verse 10. It says, for this cause ought the woman to have her head, have power on her head because of the angels. And so that third reason is because of the angels. Now that's what I want to talk about today. I want to elaborate on that statement in, in that verse there, because of the angels. Uh, the context of the whole purpose of the head covering, we said from the beginning, showed in, in their custom, that head covering showed all those things. Honor to the man, the respect of God's order in creation, and then this idea of because of the angels. If you look at verse 3, Paul prefaced this whole, this whole thing before he got into it by saying, but, uh, verse 3, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. We talked about the order of authority in God's creation. Just like there's God the Father, and God, He's the head of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of the woman. That's God's order in creation. That's why in those verses it said concerning the woman that she's of the man and created for the man. And, and, uh, and, and so the whole, the whole context has to do with authority, because the problem that's happening at Corinth with the women uncovering their heads getting rid of that custom was declaring there's no one over me, I'm my own boss, there's no such thing as what God put woman here for and what man is here for, we're going to ignore God's creation, God's divine order, and there's a rebellion. It, it, it's really just an early uh, lead into women's lib, and it certainly existed before that, but it's really taking place in society at Corinth and, and then among the women in the, in the local church as it has progressed throughout the years, uh, because there's no respect to God and His creation and the order of His creation. If you look at verse 16, which we haven't got to yet, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. It says, If any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither in the churches of God. 
and contentious, you see the idea of rebellion there, because that's what he's been dealing with in the chapter, is rebellion against God's divine order of authority in creation. And, and so th that's what the context is all about. That's important to get that context. Um, so when you think about verse 10 there, one of, one of the things, I just throw it out because we talked about it before, Verse 10, when it says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. This time he didn't say covering on her head. He said power on her head. And the reason he's saying that is that word power there speaks about authority. The woman is to have authority over her. Why? Because of the angels. And, and the covering that they did in Bible days declared that. It's still true today that a woman ought to have power on her head, authority over her, because of the order that God created her for, the purpose and the order that God created her for, and, and whether it's displayed by a head covering or displayed by a way a woman conducts herself, as Paul talked about in Timothy. Uh, it, it's still a fact. If it's still a fact that a woman ought to have power on her, on her head because of the angels and, and all the other three reasons we talked about, Ask yourself this question, and I'll just leave the question to you. Should a woman be president of the United States? Done with that. <laughs> you know, because I thought of that. You know, you, keep, you read a verse over and over again, and you think, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Anyhow, th it speaks for itself, I believe. But what I want to talk about here is the fact that Paul brings up because of the angels. And... You know, if you were attending another church, and I did this, I grabbed, I have most commentaries that I try to hang on to. No, no I could, maybe 50-50. <laughs> Some are commentaries that do teach right division, but I have probably equal amount that don't teach right division. I just checked two of them because I, I would think, what do they think Paul means when he says because of the angels? So I grabbed the first one, and the guy said, this is one of the most puzzling verses in the Bible. And, uh, but he actually went on to talk about some things that he was right on. He just shouldn't be confused like he is. The second commentary I, talked, I read uh, said that, you know, that this is a very confusing verse, debated among all the theologians, and then started to give all the different arguments about what this verse is talking about, and then talked about all the different words you can change in the verse to come up with a whole different meaning what the verse says. You know, like, uh, because of the... The angels, well that really means the messenger in respect to the pastor of the church and all that, all that kind of stuff coming out of that verse. And you realize that you know, they have no idea what that verse means. But to us at Grace Bible Church, and because we have right, know how to rightly divide the word of truth and the reason, not just know how to rightly divide it, but the reason we rightly divide it, that verse of scripture is just one of those glimpses of heaven. One of those glimpses of a window in heaven. In, in, in our study on Wednesday, we've been looking at Revelation for a few weeks now, and one of the things that we saw in the sixth seal judgment, that the heavens are going to roll back like a scroll, and the men of the earth are going to realize that they're fighting against Jesus Christ as he's coming back to take dominion of this earth. The idea of the heavens rolling back as a scroll, right now you can't look into heaven. There's going to be a time in the tribulation, they're going to be able to look up into heaven and realize the things that are happening on earth are divinely happening, and then they're going to realize who they're fighting against, and we've talked about how the Antichrist then tries to persuade them that he can defeat Christ and so forth. But anyhow, that, that idea of rolling back like a scroll, that the Bible, the, the heavens are, are clouded over, they're, they're, they're covered, we can't see. But the Bible has these verses that are like little windows into the spirit world, into heaven, and give us these little glimpses of heaven that we can actually look in, look through those windows with the eyes of faith, and understand exactly what they're talking about. This is one of those verses. So what I want to do today is talk about God's authority in the universe, and His, universe, his authority being challenged from the very beginning. That the authority, that the, the, the women in the rebellion that was going on, not only in the city of Corinth and then working into the church of Corinth, is not something new. The rebellion against God's authority began in the heavens themselves. The, to me, uh, they began Genesis 1-1, but that, that's another topic that we can talk about, the actual beginning of that. But that rebellion of authority began in the heavens and came to the earth during the fall of man. And that is when Satan then appeared before Eve and deceived Eve and, and got Adam to disobey God and then man jo got, joined God's rebellion. So that, 
that that rebellion that took place in heaven, or the rebellion against God's authority first took place in heaven, worked its way down to earth when the very creation of Adam and Eve at the very beginning, where man sins and joins that rebellion with Satan. But that rebellion progressed so that you realize that the, by the time you get to Genesis chapter 11, and by the way, what we're doing, we're going to give you a story of the Bible, that by the time you get to Genesis chapter 11, where you have the Tower of Babel, it is a time in which all the Gentiles of the world, all the nations of the world, turned against God, turned to their imagination, and got involved in idolatry, which is really just Satan worship. Satan challenging the authority of God, not only deceived the first two people born on, or made on the earth, but also deceived the, the man as he multiplied in the earth and turned away from God, and in that rebellion, the nation of Israel, who was called out and separated out from the nations to be a witness to the nations, ended up joining the rebellion with those Gentiles, being deceived by, by Satan and joining the Gentiles in idolatry, in rebellion. That's Israel was given over into captivity to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, for the reason that they turned from God like the Gentiles. Now, it took them a little longer uh, maybe not really, it's 2,000 years it took for the Gentiles to turn, but Israel joined that rebellion. And so the rebellion began in heaven and worked its way down into the earth, and God then raised up prophets to the nation of Israel to, to tell them what he was going to do and how he is ultimately going to have his authority here on earth. When he raised up prophets, he raised a prophet up like Isaiah. And, uh, and Isaiah came to warn the people about God's judgment, to call the people to repentance, just like in the days of John the Baptist. But this is back in Israel's day, before they were bring, brought into captivity to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Isaiah stands up, he warns that God is going to judge, he calls the nation to Israel to repent, then he foretells that they are going to fall. In fact, Jeremiah tells them that when they fall, they're going to go into captivity for 70 years, and then, just like all the, other, all the prophets of the Old Testament, they, be, they talk about after the time of captivity that there's going to be a restoration in, in, uh, for the nation of Israel. They're going to be restored. Now that's the story of the Old Testament. It's the story that in the short term how God brought Israel into captivity and then restored them. But it's also a picture of the bigger picture that is, is not just short term but long term how Israel is still going to go through a judgment and, and there's going to be a, a, uh, an opportunity for them to repent and so forth, but then there's going to be Jesus Christ going to come back and restore them once and for all eternally. Now that's called the day of the Lord. And, and so the prophets, when you read those Old Testament prophets, you're getting a glimpse of what's happening in their day, but they're speaking long term because ultimately God, that, that same process of the appending judgment of God, the call to repentance, he finally judges them and then restores them, that's going to be done again once and for all in the day of the Lord. And so those prophets have a twofold meaning in that. During the time that God raised up prophets like Isaiah, he gives us a glimpse into that window of heaven of where the, the rebellion actually began. So go with me to, a, maybe it's popular to you, Isaiah chapter 14. And here you get a glimpse of, we could call it Satan's rebellion, but he's Lucifer in the passage, and he becomes Satan because of his rebellion. Uh, but this is his initial rebellion against God. And, and as Israel, it's interesting that you're re reading in the prophets that Israel, it's like, it's like a picture, like, you know who you just joined in your rebellion? <laughs> It, it, it starts out in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 1. It says, The Lord will have mercy on Jacob. He will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land, and strangers shall, shall, he, shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave unto the house of Jacob. So, again, you can see here's the prophet saying Israel's going to go through a judgment, but they're going to be restored. God's going to have, he's going to fulfill his purpose with the nation of Israel. 
But as he's talking about the restoration of the nation of Israel, and in, in, in here is all involvement about the Antichrist and so forth, you have these verses starting in verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now remember, the rebellion that we see taking place on earth, first by the Gentiles and then the Jews who joined the Gentiles in rebellion against God, that that rebellion began in heaven first, before them. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, so this is a picture of Satan, the ultimate you'll see in the verse, being put in the bottomless pit, He's the one who had his way in the earth and they're looking at him and they're saying, how is it that you fell from heaven? That you're the one who did weaken the nations. Because here's was his plan. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. I'll go back to those verses in a minute. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that did, did make the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the earth to uh, uh, a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? You know, when you talk about him being chained to the sides of the pit, that's exactly at the second coming of Christ, Revelation 19, that Satan is chained to the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and loose one more time to see if he can lead one more rebellion. But this is a time where he's going to be chained in that pit, and the people are going to look and say, you're the one who did this? But he had this plan, verses 13 and 14, of what he was going to do. And this is the rebellion against God. There's five times he said, I will. And it's direct rebellion against God. And, and so he said, Thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. You have to stop and ask yourself, where was he if he said, I will ascend into heaven? But we're not going to study all these points. He says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now that's two things. That would be the location, but the stars of God in your Bible you'll see many times as a reference to angelic beings. Later on you'll see that Satan was a cherub. He already had authority over angels, but he wanted to exalt his throne. Now he had a throne, but he didn't like where his throne was. He wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God. So that's certainly in the far above heavens, above all the angelic creatures in the heavens. He said, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation of the sides of the north. I believe that's what the book of Job is all about. Where angelic beings, even Satan himself, had to appear before God and give an account of himself. And he wants to be the one that everyone's going to give an account to him. He's rebelling against God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now whether that means he's going to control the earth as well as the heavens, uh, we have to think about that one, but then he, the final statement is, I will be like the Most High. He, he didn't say, I wish I was like Him. He says, I will be. So he is trying to exalt, he's trying to rebel against God and take the authority of the universe away from God. That's the original rebellion that took place, that man is always being manipulated by Satan to join that rebellion. Old Testament, the Gentiles did it, and then it wasn't long after that, well years after that, but <laughs> centuries after that, but Israel joined that rebellion. That's the story of the Old Testament. Uh, come over with me to Ezekiel, just a couple books over yet. No, it's the other way. <laughs> it's before that. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and no, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, okay. It's after Jeremiah and Lamentation. I told you right the first time. Ezekiel chapter 28, here's another glimpse of what was transpiring in the unseen world, not just the world of man and, and the rebellion of man and God's judgment upon man and what God's accomplishing in the world, but, but the spiritual wickedness in high places that's behind all of that. Ezekiel chapter 28, it starts out talking about the prince of Tyrus. Now he's the guy that thinks he's in control, but the real one in control is the king of Tyrus. 
and that, that'll be later on in the chapter, that'll be Satan himself, but the prince of Tyrus is influenced by Satan himself. You can see it just in the, the reading of these verses. In, in Ezekiel 28 verse 1, it said, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord, the, the Lord God, because, thou hast set, because thy heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, that's among the Gentile nations, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou dost set thy heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Now I don't think the Bible is saying he is wiser than Daniel, I think that's sarcasm. This is in his thoughts that he is like God, and he sits in the seat of God, that he thinks he's wiser than Daniel. It's inter interesting that Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, would talk about the prince of Tyre as some, someone who thought he was wiser than Daniel. Because when you, we, well, in a minute we'll go to the book of Daniel. But Daniel is that great prophet in the Old Testament that lays out real clear how God is going to take dominion over this earth. And there's a battle between God and Satan, who has the right to rule. And, and this, not only does he think there's no secret that kept, because Daniel is a prophet, he's going to reveal everything. But he says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel, there is no secret that can be hid from thee. That's what he thinks. That I got this all figured out, I know exactly what God's doing, and I'm going to defeat him. So he thinks he's, now catch the term, wiser than Daniel. You know, it's been said, and you really have to stop and realize how true it is, Satan is a created being. You're going to see that in this passage. So there is no question between God and Satan who's the most powerful. The question is that Satan thinks he's wiser. That he ought to, run the, he ought to rule the world because he's a better ruler than God is. So he's challenging God's wisdom, not God's might. Because if they just had a face off, God just poof, he'd be gone. But he's challenging God's wisdom, and he thinks he's wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that can be hid from him. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten thee gold and silver unto thy treasure. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast, hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. So in his wisdom he got himself rich, but his heart is lifted up. It's full of pride. Now, he's talking, that's about the prince of Tyrus, but watch as you continue the prophecy in verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So this is the top person of wisdom, and the top person or being of, of beauty. Now, who, is, who are we talking about here? Well, verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the burly, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and, the, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So he's a creating being. But this created being who was in the garden of God, I only know there's God, there's Adam, there's Eve, and there's that serpent. This is Satan that we're talking about. It says in verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Ezekiel talks about four cherubs that are around the glory of God. But Satan used to be as Lucifer at the top, above the cherubs. It says, I have set thee so, Thou was in the holy mountain of God. Thou, di thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Well, that's what he wants in charge of that place. Thou was perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. And we know what iniquity. He said in his heart, I will. And that's the iniquity found in him, that rebellion. By the multitude of thy merchandise, thou hast filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned, thou art cast down as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Lucifer, the bright one, the shining one. 
in his beauty he corrupts his wisdom. He, he is the sum of wisdom, but his wisdom is corrupted according to that verse. But he doesn't know it. <laughs> it says, uh, I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And they're going to look in the bottomless pit and see him, and they're going to say, are you the one who did all this? So we got some glimpses of the rebellion that took place in heaven, and, and, and what prophecy is all about. When you study Bible prophecy, that has to do with the nation of Israel, God's purpose for the nation of Israel. Prophecy is the revelation of God concerning how God will restore the earth to His authority unto and by the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto the authority of Jesus Christ, but it's going to be done by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the whole, that's the, the, the restoration of the earth being restored to God's authority, ending the rebellion on earth is all about what prophecy is all about. Let me show you that. Uh, after Ezekiel comes Daniel. So Daniel chapter 2. This is kind of the premise of the whole Sunday school message today. And if you weren't there, you will add this to your thoughts. In Daniel chapter 2, here's the whole goal of prophecy. Verse 44. It says, And in the days of these kings, now that's the Gentile powers that are going to rule, the last Gentile, there's going to be four. The last one, the fifth one, is actually going to be Satan, the Antichrist, who's going to rule the earth. It says in verse 44, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And his kingdom shall not be left to other people, but shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it, God's kingdom, shall stand forever. Those are kingdoms that were on this earth that ultimately God's kingdom is going to be established on this earth, destroying all the Gentile powers and Satan himself in the second coming of Jesus Christ to set up that kingdom on earth. That's what, that's what prophecy is all about. By the way, since we're in Daniel, look at chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar needs to learn this lesson. He thought he was like a god and so God humbled him and put him, turned him into an animal. Actually, when you read this chapter, you find out about it. But when it was declared to him, to Nebuchadnezzar, what's about to happen to him because of his being lifted up in pride, Daniel said some things, and then he says, verse 17, This matter is by decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. Nebuchadnezzar conquered Israel because God used him to conquer Israel, not because he was some great thing. But he starts thinking he's a great thing, and, and he's going to learn that he was given that kingdom by God. God rules in the kingdom of men. But notice it said, this, decree, this matter is made by the decree of the watchers. Now think of the verse that we're actually coming out of. A woman ought to have power on her head because of the angels. We said last week when we talked about that verse that the angels are watching. Here's a verse, the watchers, the holy ones, we're talking about God's holy angels that didn't join Satan in his rebellion against God, that they're watching the affairs of this earth. And there's, there's these little windows that were given every once in a while about that happening. Uh, come over to chapter 10 of Daniel. When you talk about this rebellion in heaven, the holy ones are the holy angels, but there is fallen angels that Satan has sold his goods to. <laughs> they followed him in his rebellion, and you wonder, how big is that rebellion in heaven? Well, sometimes there's verses that make you think it's bigger than you first thought. And that is, when you read Daniel chapter 10, this is about Daniel, he receives a vision, and he's waiting for an understanding, and he's praying, and he's waiting. he had to wait 21 days. Three weeks before the answer to his prayer came. Came by an angel, most of the time in Daniel it's Gabriel, this time it don't say his name. But an angel finally shows up and explains to Daniel, I, as soon as you prayed, I started to come to give you an answer to your prayer, but I was hindered. There was spiritual warfare, the satanic powers did not want Daniel to get the information, the answer to, his, to the vision that he saw. But the angel finally, Michael the archangel, the top angel, freed this angel to come to Daniel to give him the, the information. So if you look at verse 18, it says, Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. This is that angel. 
And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be with thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. And he said, Knowest thou whereof I am come unto thee? And I will return and fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come forth. Now these are wars in heaven, and this is the order of the, ro- the Gentile powers that are going to rule on the earth. But, but my point is, look at verse 21. And I will show thee that which is noted in the scriptures of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. Well, well, there's no one stands with this angel except Michael the prince. How big is this rebellion in heaven? I'm not sure what extent that means. I just realized there is a large rebellion in heaven where Satan is challenging the authority of God. And, And man has joined in the creation of God Man has joined the rebellion of Satan, but a lot of angels have joined the rebellion of Satan against God. So come over with me to uh, Revelation chapter 12, but on the way, if you're fast, (laughs) and if you're not, just go to Revelation 12. I want to read a verse to you out of 1 Peter chapter 1. So Revelation 12, and if you're fast, 1 Peter chapter 1. And if you're slow like me, you'll get there. (laughs) Remember, 1 Peter, Peter's talking about God's purpose for Israel. It has to do with prophecy. And he says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, when he's talking about salvation that's going to come to Israel at the second coming of Christ, not our salvation, but the salvation that they're going to experience when Christ comes back. He says in in 1 Peter 1 and verse 10, he says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what and what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. Christ first came suffered, he's coming the second time to reign in glory. And so the Old Testament prophets, they would prophesy about things and they would say, I wonder what all that's about. You know, we have the privilege of having a complete Bible. We can actually know more than the prophets who prophesied these things. Because we've got a complete revelation. We go back and study and we can know these things. They were trying to figure these things out. Verse 12 says, Unto whom it was revealed, it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost which is sent down from heaven. Now what, notice this. Which things the angels desire to look into. The angels are watching, and they're seeing what God's doing on earth. He, they saw what God had prophesied to the nation of Israel, how they're supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, and they saw how the Jews joined the Gentiles in rebellion against God. And God says, well, I'm going to bring them into judgment, and then I'm eventually going to restore them, and I'm going to set up my kingdom on this earth, and it will never be destroyed. And the angels are watching to see, is this really happening? You know, if you're an angel looking down from heaven, even in our day, who do you think looks like they're winning the battle? (laughs) Well, most people have no idea and care less anything about God and His purpose in creation and don't even know what God's even doing today. If you were an angel looking down upon the earth, whether in Israel's program or our program, you'd have to be scratching your head and say, man, Satan said he's got more wisdom than God, and it sure looks like it. But God said, I'm going to win. I'm going to set my kingdom up here on this earth. We're talking about that rebellion that's taking place in heaven, Revelation chapter 12. I'm not going to explain the details. Just follow a couple points I want to make. Revelation 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head the crown uh, crown of, uh, of 12 stars. And she being with child travailed uh, in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Now, 
Again, we're not talking about sun. You know, stars are like our sun. <laughs> he, didn't take, he didn't take a third of the suns, S-U-Ns, of, of the heavens and cast them to the earth. <laughs> There'd be no earth. The stars there are talking about a third of the angelic beings that are in the heaven. He cast them down to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to deliver for, for to devour the child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath place prepared of God, that she should, uh, that he would, that they would feed her there a thousand two hundred three score days, three and a half years. The woman is Israel. The man-child looks like Jesus Christ, but it's really, I believe, the 144,000 that were here and now uh, they're taken into heaven and this woman has to now flee into the wilderness, the nation of Israel, because Satan's goal is to destroy the nation of Israel so that God can't keep his prophecies. So anyhow, as that's happening, right in the middle of the last seven years of tribulation before Jesus Christ comes back, it says in verse 7, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now we know who the dragon is. Which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. Now just prior to that we learned that he's, he cast out one third of the stars of heaven. Now whether this verse is referring to that one third, you can at least know that in the angelic realm, at least one third of the angels in heaven has followed Satan, if not more. So it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brother is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Neither, uh, therefore rejoice ye heavens and they that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Uh, and to the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Heaven's in the middle of the tribulation. The heaven is cl cleansed of the rebellion that's in heaven. And Satan is down to the earth. And woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Satan is here. And not only is he here, he knows he has but a short time. Well, see, this is what prophecy is all about. But the revelation of the mystery that was given to the Apostle Paul about the dispensation of grace is not about Bible prophecy. It's about something that God kept secret from the foundation of the earth and never told. Never told Daniel, never told Isaiah. Satan had no idea that God had a secret purpose that he was going to fulfill until God revealed it to the Apostle Paul. Come to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, and I'll just read the verses. They speak for themselves. You wonder why everyone just don't read it and understand it. Ephesians 3, 1 says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. And by the way, the Jew today is considered to be one of the Gentiles. They're cut off from their privileged position in judgment. It says, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. The, the, the mystery is the revelation of God that has been kept secret from the foundation of the world concerning how God will restore the heavens to his authority unto and by the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch. He says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. There's a oneness between believing Jew and Gentile today. Whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You can't search the scriptures and find this. It was never written before Paul. 
and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, now catch this, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church, that's we are the church, the body of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God, according to His eternal purpose, which He purposed in Christ, purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, what God is doing today in saving us by His grace, in this dispensation of grace that was never known about before, has a purpose, an intent, that involves the angels. That they learned something from us that they never learned before. It wasn't written in the scriptures of truth of the prophets. It wasn't given, given to Daniel. The angels are looking down, seeing how God is going to fulfill His purpose in Israel to reign on the earth, and all of a sudden he reveals to Saul of Tarsus, who was an enemy and became Paul the Apostle of the Gentiles, this revelation of truth that now teaches the principalities and powers in heavenly places some things. Now, by the way, just to save time, principalities and powers in heavenly places, doesn't that tell you there's order of authority in the heavens? There is. Principalities and powers. There's a ranking order of authority in heaven, but that authority has been challenged by Satan, and there's when it says in Ephesians 6, we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places, there is, an, there is a spiritual attack of Satan and in his followers, angelic followers, against what God is accomplishing, not only on the earth, but for the reign of the heavens. But we saw there's coming a time Satan's going to get kicked out of heaven, and here now we start realizing God had a purpose that he kept secret about saving you and I in this dispensation of the grace that's going to teach something to the angels. And when you read more, we don't have time to go through all these verses in Ephesians. You learn in chapter 2 of Ephesians that we've been made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ that in the ages to come He might show the riches of His kindness and His grace toward us. Who's He going to show it to if we're seated with Christ in heavenly places? Their angels are going to see us in heaven and see the grace of God because you know what? You don't deserve to be there. But you got there by the Lord Jesus Christ and unto His authority, unto His reigning in the heavens. So you have this. Come over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul's talking about God's purpose for us in saving us today. Verse 18, it says that Jesus Christ might be preeminent. That means above all, He's going to have the, all the authority. And verse 19, all the fullness is going to dwell in Jesus Christ. But verse 20 kind of sums it all up, saying, And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him, to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him, I say. See, it's all by Him. It's for Him and by Him. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that's us Gentiles, who were sometimes alienated and enemies by your mind, by, uh, in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, uh, now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you. The point is, is that verse tells you that Jesus Christ, has, by saving us, is the means to reconcile not just the earth to his authority, but the heavens to his authority. Come over to chapter 2. Verse 13, Here's the, you see it's Gentiles, which is 10 Brandon Sunday School class, you, this, this verse would ring in your ears. It says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, yet now hath he quickened with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. We've made alive together with Christ, having he forgave us all our trespasses blotting out handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he's made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let me explain what those verses are about to you. Spoiling principalities and powers is robbing them. He's not robbing the holy angels. Jesus Christ, by the cross, is robbing Satan of his authority over us Gentiles. We, belong, we followed Satan in his rebellion, 
And Jesus Christ, by the cross, became the means by which we could be saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. When we believe the gospel, look at chapter 1 of Colossians, look at verse 12. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We were held captive by Satan, we're part of his rebellion against God, and then God reveals a mystery to the Apostle Paul about salvation by grace through faith, and the forming of the body of Christ for the purpose of restoring the heavens to himself, and every time someone believes the gospel, it's spoiling the principalities and powers, it's robbing them of their wealth, and translating them from the, a believer from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. He's defeating Satan by the cross. Now, let's go back to Corinthians. We're almost done here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Here's these windows that have been opened up in Corinthians, and we're already in chapter 10, so we've studied these verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 1 is how Paul preaches the cross. No one preached what Jesus Christ accomplished in the cross as a payment for a full complete payment for our sins until the Apostle Paul. They preached he fulfilled prophecy through his death, burial, and resurrection. Paul tells us what he accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. So he says in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians in verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world to come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, that secret that God kept, which God ordained before the world, He kept secret before the world, from the foundation of the world, until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul, that it's unto our glory, salvation to us in this dispensation of grace. Goes on to say, which none of the princes of this world knew, now, the princes of this world are not just the human princes of this world. There are angelic princes up there in the heavens. And none of the princes of this world knew what was revealed to the Apostle Paul concerning the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Watch. Which none of the, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was the means by which God is going to defeat Satan, not only on earth, but is going to restore the authority of Jesus Christ in the heavens. That's why Jesus Christ has been exalted far above all heavens concerning our placement in the body of Christ. We're going to be raptured out into the heavens. But the point is, is the cross become the means by which that God kept it a secret that if Satan would have knew what Jesus Christ was accomplishing on that cross, becoming the means by which rebellious man can be forgiven of all his trespasses, saved, made a part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and part of the restoration of the heavens, as well as for Israel, the restoration of the earth. If Satan knew that's what Jesus Christ was accomplishing on the cross, he would have never had him crucified. God defeated Satan by keeping a secret. Oh, I thought there was no secret that could be kept from him. He kept a secret, a mystery from him. And so that's why if you come over to chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says in verse 1, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. You want to know who, what my ministry is about? My ministry is not about prophecy, it's about the mysteries of God. What Satan never knew about that's now revealed. Look down in verse 9. He says, For I think that God has set us forth the apostles last, as it were appointed unto death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. Angels are learning, if you remember that phrase from Ephesians, about the manifold wisdom of God. Not just manifold means more than one. He not only has wisdom of how he's going to restore the earth to his authority, but he had a secret that he kept, and now there's a whole second Wisdom of God that's revealed by the mystery that the angels never knew about that they learned from us, the manifold wisdom of God. And so we're made spectacles of the angels. They're watching us. Look at chapter 6. Everyone wants angels to reveal something to them, but we reveal stuff to the angels. And not only reveal something, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 3 says, Know ye not 
that we shall judge angels, how much more the things that pertain to this life. We're going to be exalted with the exaltation of Jesus Christ above the angels. We're going to put down that rebellion in heaven, and we're put in a position of reigning in the heavens. So as these angels are watching what God is doing today in defeating Satan, spoiling him of, of, of the, the hold that he had on the Jews and Gentiles, saving him by grace, and going to replace the angelic hev- the angels in heaven with the body of Christ, and then come back and defeat Satan on the earth, because Satan will know he has but a short time, and then set up his kingdom on earth. The angels watching this unfold, They're watching you take your place in the creation of God, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman. All of us, the head is Jesus Christ, just like he submitted himself to do the will of God the Father. And as the angels are watching, that 1 Corinthians chapter 10, a woman should have power on her head, she ought to realize what she, how, the order she was created and the purpose she was created, why? Because of the angels. They're watching to see, are you joining the world's rebellion now that you're a believer? Or are you going to actually declare, you're going to show the place that God has put you in his creation and and serve God in that place? And the angels are watching. So that's the reason that's in that verse. Now, let me just share with you just a, a thought that I wrote down. I'm just going to read it. We've alluded to most of the verses, not all of them. We talk about the greatest story ever told is usually talked about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But that's not the whole story. That's the means by which the greatest story ever told is going to happen. His death, burial, and resurrection became the means by which Israel will be saved and restored and his kingdom will be established on this earth forever. His salvation in this dispensation of grace is how we're going to be saved and seated with Christ in heavenly places and restore the heavens under under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the purpose of his death, burial, and resurrection, the greatest story is not just that he died, buried, and rose again and brought salvation, but what he's accomplishing in that salvation. So listen to this. Satan used the woman to get to Adam to disobey God and to bring his rebellion to the earth to mankind. Uh, now, now man has joined Satan and his angels in rebellion. But God used the seed of the woman to destroy the serpent and the power of sin and of death and of hell by the cross. Satan used his wisdom to seemingly defeat God's prophetic program, having Jesus Christ, having Jesus Christ, uh, God's, i got to read my own writing with it, Satan used his wisdom to seemingly defeat God's prophetic program to have Jesus Christ reign over all the earth by influencing the Jews to join the Gentile in crucifying him and to put the inscription, this is king of the Jews. However, the revelation of the mystery revealed God's wisdom to defeat Satan by using rebellious man who was made a little lower than the angels to bring salvation, to, you know, to bring about the crucifixion of Christ, and to bring salvation to both Gentiles and Jews, spoiling principalities and powers, make a show of them openly by the cross. Yet the Bible says, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And Satan continues his work until the body of Christ is raptured into heaven, after which Michael the archangel will cast Satan and his angels out of heaven to the earth, at which time Satan will realize he has but a short time. That is because Satan will then only have his defeated angels and the rebellious armies of man to fight against the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to reclaim his dominion in the earth. In God's wisdom, he used the weakness of man to bring salvation and victory to heaven and earth. In Satan's lack of wisdom... He will only have man's physical ability to fight against Jesus Christ at his return. Hence, he knows he has but a short time. Now, if you're not saved, you're part of the rebellion uh, and the damned, the hell was created for the devil and his angels and lost people will be there. But if you realize that what, that's what the Bible is all about and that's what the cross is all about and you trust the blood of Jesus Christ to be the payment of your sins, 
you trust in his death, burial, and resurrection, God will save you by his grace and make you part of his victory plan, eternal in the heavens. The choice is yours. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do thank you that a Bible that we have here not only just lays us wide open as far as our rebellion and our sinfulness, tells us how much you loved us and provided for us, but even beyond that, it tells, you, tells us why you save us and how it's going to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ both in heaven and earth, how everything that you created will be restored to your authority so that we will forever worship you for your, your love, your grace, your wisdom, your power, your might, for who you are. And so, Father, I pray that each person here realizes what the Bible's about and that it's true and that they will, if they haven't, that they will trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, be translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of your Son. And Father, if there's any among us that haven't trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, then I pray that he will not be or she would not be comfortable until they settle this issue, realizing that there is an eternal damnation for those that are rebellious against you and have not been saved. For the rest of us, Father, may we appreciate the glimpses that we have into the heavens and your purpose for the body of Christ and forever rejoice in what's been revealed to us, the riches of your grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.